a young naive girl moves into a small community and immediately irks a local playboy by dismissing his advances. He makes a wager with his friends to win her over within a week, but in the process of charming her, he starts to fall in love himself. Wait a minute. Isn't it the plot of that recent fanfic teen drama? Well, it kinda is, but there is a Soviet black and white comedy that follows nearly the same outline. Minus the sex. And the psychological abuse. Well, at least most of it. In the 50s and the 60s, Soviet economy was booming. Energized by a hard-won victory in the devastating war, people were eager to rebuild the country and strived for more heroic deeds, channeling it into ambitious construction projects and hard labor. In order to promote such a favorable spirit even further, the genre of occupational novels and movies was on the rise. And while most of them fell into oblivion with their heavy-handed propaganda and overzealous enthusiasm, this particular love story of a cook and a lumberjack in a remote logging camp prevailed and is loved and eagerly watched by my fellow citizens even after 60 years. The secret is the film's array of colorful characters, each with his or her intriguing story, masterfully played by talented actors who brought its most amusing and touching moments to life. Let's have a look, shall we? I'm Katya and this is Soviet Movies Explained. The movie's title is Divchata, which means the girls, or more accurately, gals. Adapted in 1961 by the director Yuri Chulukin from the novel of the same name, it was his second and most successful film. Peculiar, but his cinematic debut was another occupational comedy than Unamendables, where a righteous and enthusiastic factory girl reforms to talented but unmotivated colleagues. Both films share the same female lead, Nadezhda Rumyantseva, who plays very similar characters, energetic, truthful and easygoing, all favorable traits of an ideal Soviet girl. And while the actress is already over 30 in this movie, she depicts the wide-eyed curiosity combined with adorable naivety and domestic impracticality of her 18-year-old heroine, Tosha, perfectly. Meanwhile, notice this popular Soviet slogan that means peace to the world. Tosya, a fresh college graduate, arrives at a snowy Siberian lumber camp for her first job and is shown to a female dormitory by the camp's manager, who subtly warns her against any romantic relationships because then she and her potential suitor would demand a separate room and currently there are none available. This is a good illustration of the typical living conditions at most new Soviet settlements unless you were some big official. Most of them were dorms housing 5 to 10 people in one room with facilities outside and a private room was the most a young family could hope for. Tosia makes herself at home and unabashedly rummages through the possessions of her roommates, fixing herself a feast. The most prominent part of this is a majestic butterbrot, an entire loaf of white bread cut lengthwise and topped with jam. The word itself originates from the German name for buttered bread, but was adopted into Russian as any combination of bread and topping, sweet to savory alike and not necessarily featuring butter. Characteristically, such blatant disregard for private property doesn't offend Tosia's new neighbors except one. Her behavior is presented as somewhat eccentric, but cute, even noble, since she is ready to share her meager possessions and sharing and helping each other out with top Soviet virtues. That's why the possessiveness and arrogance of one woman, Anfisa, makes her, if not a straight-out antagonist, then at least a problematic character. A notion further enhanced by her caring much about her looks vanity, and going out with multiple men without any strings attached. Harlot. Unlike earlier Soviet movies with their clumsy cardboard villains and saboteurs, Anfisa is an intriguing grey character, an example of a person who performs her primary duty to work for the country without a hitch, but fails to embrace the moral values of a model Soviet citizen. But don't you worry, she'll see the error of her ways by the end of the film. Since the film's name is Gals, in the plural, despite Tosia being its focal point, each of her other roommates has a story arc too. Nadia has a fiancé who is much older than her and somewhat shabby. Her roommates suspect that she settled for him only because Nadia is almost 28 and desperate to get a husband. Oh my god. On the other hand, he is thrifty and doesn't smoke or drink. Quite a catch. Chiful Katya, my namesake, is the least troubled of the bunch. She has a stable and loving relationship with the local electrician and proves to be a loyal friend. 
Vera, the oldest, calmest and most reasonable of the girls, so much so that Tosha starts to call her mama Vera and Anmaya for studiously working on her degree via distance education. She regularly receives letters from her estranged husband that she burns without reading. Tosia has been raised in an orphanage, which partly explains her unselfish behavior, childish appearance and clumsy pranks. She is proud to reveal to be a cook, having just graduated from a culinary college. Moreover, she appears to be quite good at her job, not only cooking deliciously, but also getting to improve her workplace and optimize the processes. The latter was a big trend at the time, encouraging workers to show initiative and innovate. However, great food at the canteen was a bit of a joke, since such establishments were generally known for their inedible watered-down cooking. Next scene is at the village community hall, commonly known as the club, where we first get a good glimpse of the dominating footwear, valenki, wool felt boots that used to be an essential part of a Russian winter outfit. They work pretty well in dry frosty weather, but have no soles and are not water resistant, so they have to be either dried after every wear or worn with rubber galoshes. That's why, despite the popular stereotype, valenki are no longer worn anywhere, but maybe in extremely rustic places. The camp manager changes the portraits of work brigade of the week at the local honor roll, the Skapachota, an inherent part of Soviet environment. In order to further promote hard work and increase productivity, the state encouraged individuals and work units to compete among each other in production volumes and take on additional commitments. Best workers, udarniki, were highly praised and hanged, meaning their portraits were placed on an honor roll for everyone to see. Sometimes they might even get a raise or a hefty bonus or even a medal. Anyway, this episode teaches us that at least in theory, most popular boys were not the most handsome or most intimidating or arrogant, but most hardworking. Although being handsome surely wouldn't harm, and being arrogant won't hurt. Ilya, the attention-loving and overconfident leader of the Wing Brigade and, you have guessed it, Tosia's future love interest, was played by Nikolai Rybnikov, perhaps the biggest star of the cast. He was already well established as a dream guy of millions of Soviet women, having portrayed similar industrious, good-natured laborers in numerous other occupational films. He was considered a bit old for this role, although he is the same age as Romanceva, but lost 20 kilos in order to look younger. Ilya and his team constantly challenged their closest rivals, Filia's Brigade, and not only on the work field but also during leisure times, at the game of checkers for example. At the beginning, Ilya is irritated by losing several pieces and sends one of his minions to stop the distracting music, which infuriates Tosia. But eventually he wins and decides to bestow the tiny shrew with his attention and invites Tosia to dance. She makes him put out his cigarette first, then take off his fur hat. By the way, keeping hats on indoors was quite a norm at the time, even a status thing, if your hat was made of some rare precious fur. Women often chose to keep their hats on if they came in for a short while in order not to ruin their hairdos. A good example is this thing from my previous video. After all that, Tosia brushes him off with So that you know, I don't dance with the likes of you. A catchphrase and gesture that were eagerly adopted by kindergartners and mid-schoolers all around the Soviet Union. Humiliated, Ilya storms away, followed by Filia, who wants to rub it in. Ilya proposes a wager that within a week Tosia would be desperately in love with him, staking their hats as prizes. Next day, Ilya launches his campaign. At lunch, he and his team, some of whom are really reluctant to pass on a great meal, pretend that Tosia's cooking is disgusting, bringing her to tears. Yet, the plan seems to work. For the next day, she sets off to the forest to deliver the lunch directly to their workplace. While the streets of the lumber camp were built at the back lot of most film studios, where more than 300 fir trees were planted and snow made out of cotton wool and mothballs, location shooting was first done at the real logging place near Oral Mountains. But the minus 30 degree frost made them wrap it up and move to a slightly milder climate of central Russia. Moreover, pickups were shot at the film studios in Yalta, Crimea, which is in subtropics. So when you notice an outside scene where no steam is coming out of people's mouths, it means that actors are most likely boiling in their heavy clothing. The team's resolve is weakened by hunger and Tosia's valor and lack of animosity, and they wolf down the soup that she brought. By the way, they say that somewhere during this scene, Rybnikov accidentally licked a spoon that had already cooled off and his lip froze to it. In order not to delay the production, he rips it off with a piece of skin, thus immensely impressing the crew. 
Tosa, in turn, impresses the brigade with her culinary knowledge and pride that she takes in her work by reciting multiple ways to cook potatoes. Peculiar, but she calls deep-fried potatoes pie. No idea where that comes from. Ilya shows her his prize tool, a chainsaw, that was a novelty then. Its brand name, Druzhba, meaning friendship, to this day remains the source of numerous jokes and memes about the price of friendship or friendship winning in a confrontation. The following evening, he takes a more straightforward approach and walks Tosi home after an evening class, attempting to kiss her at the end. She rebuffs him with indignation, but later in her room dances of happiness. Meanwhile, I should shortly draw your attention to this picture by Tosi's bed. It's a photo of Yuri Gagarin, the very first astronaut. His flight took place on the 12th of April, 1961, instantly making him a celebrity, loved and admired by everyone in the Soviet Union. Another portrait by Vera's bedside reinforces her image of the serious person and a scholar. It's Alexander Pushkin, famous Russian poet, author of Evgeny Onegin. He is as significant for Russian literature as Shakespeare is for English. Shortly after, Katya, Tosi's closest friend who warns her of Ilya's reputation as a womanizer, he used to go out with Anfisa. Tosi takes heat, but the emotional swings continue to rock, with alternatively one of them brooding and another seeking attention. One evening, the girls discuss love and reasons why people fall for one another. Anfisa expresses an unpopular opinion that there is no such thing as love, just a stupid fairy tale for the narrow-minded. This infuriates Tosia, who declares that at the orphanage they used to beat up wretches like her, which is quite distinctive. The bullies will harass themselves, and it is presented as a right and noble act. The exchange escalates to a catfight, interrupted by a surprise inspection from the new director. Anfisa switches her charms to the fullest, completely bewitching the man. Later, when Ilya and Tosia are in their agreeable face and promenade by the dorm late at night, roommates speculate whether his feelings for Tosia are genuine. Anfisa tells them about the bet, which appalls the girls but leaves them confused as of how to proceed. They fear that the revelation might irreparably damage Tosia's trust in people. But as the wager's date draws near and Tosia becomes more and more infatuated with Ilya, the girls become desperate and finally break it to Tosia. Collected at first, she confronts Ilya and Filia, forcing them to acknowledge the wager and the fact that Filia won, but breaks down in tears later. Some time passes, and we see that Tosia has got a brand new canteen thanks to the new director, and Ilya hunts the place trying to apologize, but all she gives him is a cold shoulder and numerous second servings that he can no longer stomach. Yet later, when Mama Vera doesn't burn the next letter from her husband, contemplating that maybe she has punished him enough for a short affair with some coquette like Anfisa, that makes Tosia consider forgiveness as well. At the same time, she gives her most famous speech that became a catchphrase, fantasizing how, if she were beautiful as Anfisa, she would rain vengeance upon all men. So, I'm striding along the street, gorgeous, and all the men are stunned, and most susceptible just topple and pile up in stacks. Meanwhile, Anfisa taunts Ilya, who continues to stalk the relentless Tosia, flaunting her own carefree lifestyle. By the way, Rybnikov actively pitched his wife, also a famous actress for Anfisa's role, and was not particularly friendly to the actress eventually picked. Additionally, almost all Anfisa's close-ups were severely cut to make her less gorgeous. The director was worried that otherwise no one would believe that Ilya could have chosen playing Tosia over such a woman. Yet, later that night she has a breakdown, seeing Ilya's misery over insignificant Tosia as proof of love existence and laments that everyone treats her as a pretty plaything, then ends up loving and marrying others. I promised redemption, didn't I? Meanwhile, Ilya broods in a manner that would put any heroine of the Victorian novel to shame. He lies prone in bed, refuses to eat and sighs loudly. His friends, including regretful Filia, try to cheer him up and propose to pacify Tosia with a valuable gift. Ilya likes the idea of golden watches, an extremely expensive and extravagant thing. Everyone in the room chips in, including Nadia's reluctant fiancé. This is the first scene that casts him in an unfavorable light, as he was nothing but caring earlier. But this small act of close-fistedness manipulates us into resenting his petty ways. The gift is delivered, but Tosia, delighted at first, quickly composes herself and refuses to accept it. Ilya smashes the watches in anguish and storms away, leaving Tosia in tears and with the realization that she still loves him. 
Spring comes and everyone is laboring to finish several houses for the new families, including the one for Nadia and her future husband. Yet we see that the closer the date, the more reluctant she is to marry him. Actually, there was a scene where Nadia breaks her engagement off, but it was cut, as it was adding too much drama for a supposedly like-hearted comedy. That really upset the actress so much so that she refused to come to the film's premiere. Newly reformed Anfisa is shown to decline the invitation to a dance from the camp director, who by the way is hauling cement along with everyone else, and is now much friendlier with Tosia. The latter still hasn't patched things up with Ilya, oscillating between indignation and worry for him. Yet, thanks to his friend's ploy, they meet at the attic of the new house and finally reconcile. In the final scene, Tosia is seated with Ilya at lover's bench, the very spot the manager warned her against at the beginning of the movie. He proposes to marry Tosia and coaxes her to kiss him. Such a kiss, often obscured with hair, hats and colors, was the pinnacle of sexual interaction at the strictly censored Soviet film industry. Tosia giggles and admits that she used to wonder how people kiss without their noses getting in the way and now she finally understands how it works. She's also reluctant to kiss him in return, because then there would be nothing left for later. Ilya assures her that there is plenty left for later. And there the film ends. So what do you think? Does this film deserve its fame and nationwide love? In my opinion, it could have been utterly formulaic and forgettable, if not for the fascinating performance by its lead actress. Named Charlie Chaplin in a skirt, Romyantseva had unrivaled comedic and dramatic talents that helped her convey the explosive energy and vitality of the young and innocent Tosia, who at the same time remained strong and rational under stress. Supporting cast was solid, lending credibility to the subplot about the power of friendship. Real stuff, not the chainsaw. The movie Devchata is freely available on Mosfilm Studios' YouTube channel with subtitles in English, French and Turkish. Links are in the description. Additionally, if you wish to see more film featuring Nadezhda Rumyantseva, I link two of her other most prominent works. The 1959 film The Unamendables that I already mentioned at the beginning of this video. And The Gas Station Queen of 1962, which to me is Auntie La, La Land. A girl dreamt of becoming a figure skater but found happiness managing and designing petrol stations. Both are occupational comedies and share the main cast of actors, their performance sincere and heartwarming. As usual, your sharing, commenting and re-watching my videos, as well as subscribing and supporting me on Patreon, is a tremendous help in my work and a source of great joy. Thanks for watching and until my next video. Perhaps you can guess which Soviet classic I will be explaining next? Чарующий.